I think we're ready. Welcome to the Late Tonight Show, starring Pete Sheriff. Our very special guest, Dennis Seaton from Musical Youth. And we take your phone calls live on air. And now, live from Solly Hall, just outside Birmingham, just off the A45, please welcome your host, Pete Sheriff! Welcome to the show. This is Late Tonight. My name's Pete Sheriff and thank you for joining us. Uh, whether you're on Twitch, whether you're on YouTube, whether you're on Facebook, whether you're on... Uh, where else are we? <laughs> I don't know. We're all over the place. Thank you for joining us on the show. We've got a great show lined up for you. The one and only Dennis Seaton is here from Musical Youth and we're going to have a little bit of fun before Dennis comes on. So, what's been happening this week in the news, well, <laughs> where do you start? This is probably going to go down in history as the craziest week. Because just think about it. Think about what's gone on this week, man. <sighs> just, oh, let's put some, let's put it, there we go. Let's put a bit of background music in it. I haven't got an audience, so I might as well have some tunes. <clears throat> so, when I say I have got an audience, that means there's no one here. Just me. I have been a bit tickly today. I haven't got a cough or a cold or anything. I haven't got the Rona. You're all right. <laughs> uh, so, what's been happening? Oh, man, what a crazy week. I tell you what, NBC, uh, MSNBC, the, uh, the news branch... Uh, I've had some bloopers going on, which I found quite amusing. Um, scouring through the news feeds after the election and the results and then a vaccine thing and this and that. I quite enjoyed finding this little blooper from MSNBC the other day. Check this out. With the incoming Biden team or not handling it, we should say, to a certain extent. This time it involves our intelligence community. Uh, Ken, what have you learned, sir? It just makes me laugh because he's just, he's either new, actually I don't think he is, or he just wasn't ready, or wasn't expecting that question, which I thought was really funny. Uh, but anyway, and you know, I don't know whether you know, but there's lots and lots of uh, late night hosts. Um, there's me, really. Uh, there's Jimmy Kimmel, who we'll come on to in a second. There's, um, uh, there's Jimmy Fallon who seems to be on holiday at the minute. Uh, there's also uh, him from NBC, uh, from CBS. Uh, you know, there's loads of them. Uh, there's the man who shall never, ever be named on this show. Uh, and a few others. But my one that I am, um, shall we say, uh, not in love with, I think that's a little bit strong, but the one I like the most, he's got a great sense of humour and the show comes up with some great stuff. <clears throat> and I just thought that I would show you some stuff. If you're not uh, aware of late night television in the States, it is a bizarre landscape because CBS have a go, ABC have a go, NBC has a go. They all have a bash. Um, but ABC, the uh, Jimmy Kimmel, late night with Jimmy Kimmel or tonight with Jimmy Kimmel, whatever it is, um, he has a great feature which he calls unnecessary... Well, uh, unnecessary censorship with that beep so basically they bleep out they have get various news clips and things and they bleep out words that may or may not be rude now i don't know whether you know but in america on network television you cannot swear it is forbidden it's just i mean you swear on american television you're you disappear forever uh, a bit like that guy who we saw a few minutes ago. Uh, but that was capable, so you're fine. Uh, however, uh, unnecessary censorship is something that Jimmy Kimmel does, and it's hilariously funny. Check this out, because uh, here's just one of last week's unnecessary censorship. It's uh, really pretty amazing what happened, because I wasn't feeling great. And the next day, I wake up, and I'm saying, like... Uh, 
Who can I f*** today? <laughs> Donald Trump, Joe Biden, off one last time. The president's small d*** has grown by 50%. The question is, is it enough? And I guess we'll find out in a couple of weeks. All right, f*** you both. <laughs> Predictions! <laughs> As the series go by, the get bigger. <laughs> Just like you went with f***ing, we're not going to have f***ing. We're going to stop f***ing. We're going to stop f***ing. Then he goes to Pennsylvania after he gets a nomination where he got very lucky to get it. And he goes to Pennsylvania <laughs> and he says, oh, we're going to have f***ing. And Steve, the crew is wondering when they can actually touch your <laughs> when I'm done. <laughs> yes, I am just helping mucking out down here at cute little pigs. And I'm joined by pig f***er Harry. Harry, why didn't you tell me they bite? I love you, Philadelphia. Honk if you're f***ed up. Honk if you're ready to go. Are you f***ed up? Are you ready to go? Are you f***ed up? Are you ready to go? <laughs> uh, oh, it's just my favourite. It's my favourite. If you don't know Jimmy Kimmel, uh, and you know, thanks to M uh, ABC for that, by the way. Uh, if you don't know the show, check it out on YouTube. All the clips are on there, and all the unnecessary censorship. Oh dear. Well, what else we got here? Before we bring our guest on tonight, let's see what else we got here. Uh, yeah, well, I, I kind of make a script, and and sometimes I stick to it, and sometimes I don't. Uh, but I got to get the guest on. I think it's important because he he is. You're going to learn something in a minute about this guy. If you don't know musical youth, you never heard of them. You don't know what they're about. Just stay tuned for the next hour or so because you are going to be amazed what this guy has been through and has done in his life. And when it all started, you will be amazed. All right, so let's get him on. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome frontman of musical youth and all round legend, the one and only Dennis Seaton.
So, uh, Dennis Seaton from Musical Youth is here. Uh, we've got some dodgy camera angles going on, uh, but I'm gonna I'm gonna work on that. Don't worry, everyone. It's all cool. Uh, if you're watching wherever you're watching from, thank you for tuning in. Um, it's a little bit of a weird show tonight because normally what happens is we're ultra ready, but tonight for some reason we weren't. <laughs> hey, say that again. I think it's me. Yeah, I think it might be. I think it might be you. I was ready, though. You were uh, you were ultra early, and I'd had a shower and everything, and I was sat in here at uh, at thirty two minutes past, and uh, and then everything went horribly, horribly wrong. But it's fine. We're here. It's all good. Okay, mm -hmm. let's. I've got question. I've got questions for you, Dennis. I've got questions. Obviously, yeah. there's a new album coming very, very soon. But I want to go right back to the beginning of Musical Youth and find out exactly how all this came about. Because uh, the, for those of you who don't know, uh, we didn't live by each other when we was kids. We were on the same bus route. And it's become a bit of a joke between Dennis and I. <laughs> that I introduced, if I ever introduced the band, I, I, in <laughs> I introduced them as the greatest thing that come from the 55 bus routes. <laughs> Yeah. And yeah, uh, the 55 bus used to go from Chelmsley Wood to Birmingham City Centre. And, right. um, and 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 uh, at some time, uh, a number of times, I think, uh, you'll correct me if I'm wrong on this, Dennis, but uh, I've been on the back of the bus and you've been on the back of the bus because everybody uh -huh. in, in, in those days, the, 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 the cool thing to do would be to sit on the back of the bus and uh, yeah. and just you know nod the journey through, man. <laughs> well, if, you, if you remember, Pete, if you're old enough to remember this part, on a Monday, yeah, you could get on any bus for any distance for five p. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, I do. Take full advantage of that. <laughs> well, what you see now, me and my crew, we would yeah. we would get on the bus, we do the the two p Sunday, five p Monday, right? We do the two P thing and get off at Saltley, and then yeah. get on the number eleven. Oh, the number eleven was the longest route. <laughs> yeah, the outer route. that's the that's outer circle around Birmingham. Outer circle. Number and, eight was the inner circle. And and let me tell you, if you've got nothing better to do, then uh, it, <laughs> and you want a journey, get on the number eleven and go around the outer yeah, circle. It, it was the it was the walk it was the walkathon route, wasn't it? That's right. That's that right. Yeah. My head as well. <laughs> The anyway, so let's go back to the beginning. How did Musical Youth come about? I, I think I've got an idea, but I want to know the truth from you. Well, give me your idea first, and we'll see I, if it matches. I was under the impression that it was a, it was a school project. That's that's kind of what I... I, I we were all okay. told as kids that's what was going stop, on. I'm going to stop you there. Right? Okay because it was never a school project. Okay. That would be nice if you were trying to write a story. <laughs> See the bracket there? I like them. I like them air quotes there, man. Right. So here's how it works. Okay. What happened was, um, Ju um, Junior and Patrick, the drummer yes. and bass player, their dad, <laughs> his friend, which was Michael and Calvin's dad, Yeah. he was teaching them Michael piano or keyboard and yeah. Calvin guitar. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, he said he was coaching his two sons. Yeah. One played bass and one played drums. That's what Patrick was Jr. And mm -hmm. then they decided to put it all together. And he was singing lead. Right. No, Fred Wayne Jr. Senior. He was singing lead. And the band, they, he formed that in the summer of 1979. Yeah. And they used to rehearse in his house at number 2017. Offering house. Okay. Not there anymore. Kennet Road. Yep. And uh, you can imagine he's in a masonette. So there's people above him, people to the left and right. So with the band in the living room, obviously it's going to be noise. And uh, that's where it all started. From right. Them, them two families coming together. Okay. And then Fred was singing lead. Okay. And I, I, I did, how did you, I, I was, ah, <laughs> how then, did you get, get in there? <laughs> so then, the next step now is Junior and myself were real close friends, so we were tight. Yeah. And we built up our relationship throughout the summer. And I actually went to the very first rehearsal. Okay. Band. Very, very first rehearsal. And I got banned 
Yeah. B A double N E D, not B A N D. <laughs> yeah. On the rehearsal for after the first day, Fred, his dad said, "Don't come back." Really? So, mm, yeah, yeah. So, Don't come back. I don't want you in here. <laughs> go, go on, <laughs> So, I have to go with Junior to the to the door, and then see you later. See you after rehearsal. So a couple of hours later, we'd be hanging out again, and just because him and I were so close and he knew I liked singing. Yeah. When they required, they'd done, the band had done shows all over the, you know, in mainly the black working men's clubs. Right. And um, festivals and stuff. Mm -hmm. And at the time it was high unemployment, so they were doing, you had the Salty Music Workshop, I don't know if you remember, down at the bottom of Salty Gate. Yeah. The, the building's still there. Salty Music Workshop was at the bottom of Salty Gate, and as you're going up, up, up Allen Rock Road, you'd see it mm -hmm. just by the roundabout now. Yeah. Anyway. Is that that place uh, on the corner? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As you're up from the roundabout, so you see it right on your left. That's on your yeah. left. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The one splits off the Washford Eve, or Ward End. Yeah. Washford Eve. Yeah. And then mm -hmm. the other one goes goes up Allen Rock Road. Mm -hmm. Anyway, they recorded a single called Political in General. Yeah which the late, great John Peel played. Okay. Because that was the time when DJs could pick what they wanted to play. Yeah. <laughs> Back in the real days. We, in the, there were real DJs. They had to find their own music. So John Peel played it. From that, it was an a &R guy who heard it. Because the A&R guys all used to listen to John Peel. Yeah. So then this A&R guy, he, his name was Charlie. Yeah, he got in touch with Tony Owens, who's the manager of the band, who's looking after the band and Fred. And said, "Look, we're interested. I'm interested because of what I've heard. Yeah. And the uh, problem I've got is, you got this man here and these young kids. <laughs> if any way you could find somebody to match their age. Yeah. And we had. We went to our music teacher. Well, I say we. <laughs> I went with Junior to the music teacher, and he said, "Look, you can sing. And I've tried that before, and he said, "Nah, you're not good enough. Go away." <laughs> But because of the record company interest, yeah. time was off the essence. So they put a like a little flyer in this music department to say, look, looking for a music, this band's looking for a singer, musical, you boom, boom, boom. Nobody turned up apart from me. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody turned up did, apart did, from did, me. Is that when you took the notice out your pocket? <laughs> no, 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 not at all. And, um, the rest, they say, is history. But to be fair, when I did my first rehearsal with just the band, we'd written a song. Yeah. And that ended up being the B-side of this. No. No, it wasn't. We never used it. We never used it, but we recorded a song in rehearsal. Yeah. And then we I had to get on to rehearsals. And we had to, I had to rehearse seven days a week. I say I. We had to rehearse seven days a week. So after school, weekends, bang, bang. Just just, just trumping it out all the time. Wow. Practicing, practicing, practicing. And Fred was a taskmaster. It wasn't no pretty, no, you know, you can't get it right now, so we'll give you another go. It was find the biggest ashtray. If you don't play it right, if you don't sing it right, <laughs> that's what that meant to you. It's going to come your way. <laughs> um, but to be fair, it made us uh, better musicians. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And um, we we went on and we did some... I did my first show at the Casablanca Club in Cardiff. Okay. And I'll never forget that. <laughs> I was 14. <laughs> and, man... <laughs> that's how you say... <laughs> that's like 14 trying to sing this song. <laughs> <laughs> Got your Pavarotti on, man. That's what it was like. But um, obviously, we practice and get better. Yeah. And then we did we did a show, we did a, a showcase for the record company. Mm -hmm. and that, in the meantime, Charlie Air had moved from A and M Records to be head of A and R at MCA Records, right. which is now Universal, as you know. Yes. And. Uh, when he signed us, and I didn't know this until he told me, he said he signed us, and people used to, because they were on offices and floors, so the MD was, 
it used to be a time when you'd go in and you'd have um, pho photography, hey, um, promotions downstairs, and then A&R second, for, you know? And he said people used to come from downstairs to look at him to see see this man who signed this young group. <laughs> it was never going to work. And um, he was when he told me, I was like, he said, yeah, people used to come and have a look in my office to see who this guy was who signed this young band because he doesn't know what he's doing if he's an A&R guy. <laughs> and um, we then signed to Universal. Yeah. We were doing some shows. We are doing some shows in, um, we did it. We did a show with Dunlets upstairs at Ronnie's we used to do. Okay. And, and the dressing room was so small, you could only dress two at a time. Can you imagine? We're all, well, Calvin was nine, 10, yeah. <laughs> Head. and we had to come out for each of us to get changed that's how small it is because <laughs> you imagine trying to do that now just having a 10 year old on on yeah. a on in just in craziness a in a nightclub unbelievable in a nightclub runnies upstairs at runny scots this was wow in West End. and done let's used to run this night and uh i was walking across to go to the toilet and I looked, I saw this, but I thought it was a girl. But I thought it was a boy. <laughs> what it was. Anyway, so I walked. And when I saw when I saw him, I <laughs> ran back and got all the others so they could come and have a look and pointed him out. It was boy George. Boy George. <laughs> <laughs> and he told me this because we went to do a show supporting Culture Club. The Culture Club had already signed to Island but Virgin Records. Yeah. They weren't having much success. So, you know, they're trying to break this band. And we did, uh, I'll never forget it because the day we went to London to do the show, it was a rail and tube strike. Right. If you know London, no rail, no tube, traffic. You're going nowhere. <laughs> nowhere fast. <laughs> anyway, we got to, it was Heaven, which was the biggest gay club in London yeah. at the time. We didn't know, it didn't matter to us, it was just a gig. We were supporting Culture Club. So... When we get there, when we get there, we um, set up. We go to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you got visitors. Hold on. <laughs> this is what happens when you do interviews at home. Can you hear that? Is it what's what? What is it? I can't tell you. Okay. <laughs> right, we'll leave that there. <laughs> okay. Okay, <laughs> who's that? Who's that? Oh, I'm... <laughs> <laughs> She's getting energy now. Nice. Hello. Anyway, she's gone now. She's gone. gone now. And <laughs> so we did this show, and the A&R guy came, Charlie, and yeah. it was it was sold out, round. So we used to do all the, the latest reggae songs, and Faster Cutchy was number one at the time. Right. So we used to do Faster Cutchy. Yeah. You know, set, mm -hmm. and the place went up. I mean, just went up when we started playing past the Kutchi. Mm. And he actually said, look, um, I mean, prelude to that, they'd already started, we'd already started recording with Fun Boy 3. Right. So Neville, Terry and um, Limba. Mm -hmm. and then we're at number one with Lunatics. Okay. And, uh, oh no, it was Ain't What You Do. Right. So there was a number one with Ain't What You Do. And uh, he said, this song, is there any way you can change the lyric? Uh, well, we'll try. He said, because the crowd just went absolutely nuts. So when we were doing the demo for the album, the demo was what you do pre to let the record company know what you're going to record and how you're going to record. Anyway, he, uh, we went back to the studio up here at Frank Scarf studio in Birmingham and did the, the, the eight songs, did past the Dutchie and past the Kutchie. In fact, we just recorded past the Dutch Kutchi and went in the studio and said, how can we change the lyric? And we just went, well, you got Kutchi. What about Dutchie? It was literally that simple. Oh, no. Obviously, way. you have to go back and change the line. How does it feel when you got no herb? <laughs> <laughs> how does it feel when you got no food? <laughs> and things like that. So, yeah, that's where it all spawned from. Okay. And then in, we also did... A session for John Peel. Wow. So we did 
we did two jump hill sessions one with fred singing lead yeah the second one with me singing lead okay so it kind of everybody's like wow okay and we did it we recorded that at um abbey road believe it or not uh, all these right. things come back to me because <laughs> it's like if I don't throw it in, people look. Oh, this what's you know? This is Abbey Road. Everybody knows Abbey Road. Well, this <laughs> is the they, thing. The BBC did their recordings at Abbey Road. This is Sorry. the thing. Well, one thing I know about you is 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 you're not you're not a one trick pony, and that that's the that's the amazing thing about this man. You, you every time I see you, right? If if I see you whether at Butlins or at, at in town or whatever. Yeah. You got. You've always got some amazing, crazy story about. Uh, Is it crazy? Yeah, well, there's one time. One time you said to me, "I said, where you been?" <laughs> and you oh, said, God. "I just got off a plane." <laughs> and and you'd been um you'd been to LA with was it LA or New York? One or the other. You'd LA. been recording with. And d tell me that. Tell tell the viewers all about that situation. Which one? The last, the last time when I saw it, a couple of years ago. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, this is um, this is what I'm talking about. This guy, right? <laughs> this is why he's on this show because <laughs> what he's about to tell you is mind blowing. Go on, go for it. Which one do you want, though? I want them all, man. I want them all. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I got this message from this guy saying, "Look, I'm interested in getting you booked for a show." Blah blah blah. I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. You get them all the time. Anyway, turns out. The show was a festival called the Great American Smoke Out Festival. And the Great American Smoke Out Festival, obviously, is what it is. Because <laughs> weed in America, in LA, in yes. Los Angeles, or in Southern California is legal. Yes. So it was the 25th anniversary. The show was headlined by Snoop Dogg, and it was supposed to be Wu Tang, but it wasn't Wu Tang in the end. It was, uh, I'll tell you, Bone Stokes and Harmony, mm -hmm. and uh, Cypress Hill. Wow. And yeah, yeah, yeah. So I ended up and flying out to and, and and you know sometimes people chat once and so we had to get we had to get the visa to go and do this show. The visa's coming at uh three thousand dollars each. I wasn't wow. paying that. I wasn't paying that. Anyway, I found a friend of mine who's a big time he's a big time promoter or management company. And I said to him, well, this guy's got in touch with me. He works with me, blah, blah, blah. He said, Dennis, and you know, it's, it, people can chat. But he said, if this guy's working with Snoop, he's got the money. You don't have to worry about that. Because <laughs> <laughs> Snoop people do not mess about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I got out to, I went out to LA the third, we flew out the Thursday uh, and landed Friday and Saturday was the gig. And I, I ended up backstage with, with, um, Afro man, <laughs> remember that guy? <laughs> because I got high. Because I, great, Bone Thugs and Harmony, Cypress Hill, um, and Snoop was fantastic. And these people just said, "You can't have too many people." And it was only me and my son that actually got in to see him, and he was cool, man. He was sad. Wow. After the flip, and I said, "No, I don't smoke anymore." <laughs> but. Um, I lived in Los Angeles when I was 20. Yes. My 21st birthday. And uh, I actually went to dinner. I went, I went to, I was signed to Island Records. And I went to a showcase with a, a lady named um, Kim Bewey. And Kim Bewey was like a hippie. hippie. She was long hair. When she listened to the music, she would rock like this. <laughs> anyway, Kim said, Dennis, come with me. I'm going to see this, 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 this band. And I'm like, okay. Now, I don't see no instruments. I'm seeing decks. Right, okay. Yeah. See these these uh, four guys, and I, I didn't go, waited. Then uh, we go to an Italian restaurant, and Kim's here, like to my right. Opposite me was Dr. Dre. No. Then I had Easy. No. Then I had and then I had, <laughs> yeah, Koo. Really? So five of us. The six of us were sat for two hours in an Italian restaurant while Kim is trying to find out what NWA stands for. No. I'm telling you no lie. No way to lie. Dre, I said, Dre, what do you play? I said, what do you play? He said, I play an SL 1200 Mark, Mark II, man. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> and for some reason, Easy took a like. We we got on all right, man. Me and Easy was cool. And we came out to that restaurant after two hours. And King says, I know it stands for no whites allowed. It stands for no whites allowed, Dennis. I know that's what it stands for. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my touch. That was my touch with the uh, superstar. That's that's crazy. The, the, and I, and you know. <sighs> I, I always I enjoy I enjoy talking to you. You know that, and and we we become we become friends o mm -hmm. uh, over the time we've been working together. And and you do. Man, you got a number of Yeah, yeah <laughs> fifty five brothers, man. Yeah, well. <laughs> and, and I just I I just I love the stories. I love the thing the things you've done. But what I mean, you told me see yeah every time again every time I speak to you, you tell me something <laughs> else. <laughs> this wasn't on my original list of questions right and and somebody just texted in and said why do i keep looking that way it's because dennis is actually on the screen there so i i, I have to keep he's talking to me and i have to keep looking that way so apologies i will figure out a way of moving the camera over there for next week's show but anyway you told me a story on the phone the other day about saturday night live oh <laughs> now, now it's, this is probably the only time I will ever talk to anybody who's been on SNL. So yeah. <laughs> your expert, and I mean, we're talking about, um, we're not talking about current SNL. We're talking no. about the days, the classic SNL. If you don't know what the SNL is, it's Saturday Night Live. It is America's longest running live TV show. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it's been running longer than WWE Raw and The Simpsons yeah. and all them sort of TV shows. It is mainstay american um uh, uh tv viewing and um but people like um uh chevy chase uh the blues brothers uh, obviously um uh the, the, and yeah dan yeah Aykroyd. dan Aykroyd, that's yeah that's when they will cut their teeth yeah you know it is even um eddie eddie murphy um, yeah eddie and eddie murphy and that that's a Cut to the cut to the story you told me the other day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did. Uh, How old were you, by the way? How old were you I when was, this was going on? I was on? sixteen when we went. Wow. We went to we flew from when we did Saturday Night Live. We flew to Jamaica to do the two videos, Heartbreaker yeah. and Never Gonna Give You Up. Mm -hmm. And the whole of the one side of the plane was everybody involved with the band. So it's one party from London. Wow. Montego Bay. Yeah, <laughs> you can imagine. And that was the time when people would smoke on airplanes and all that. Not that we were smoking, but you, you, that's how long ago it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so we flew from Kingston to New York. So we've gone from the oven, yeah, to the freezer, because it was minus eight when we landed in New York. Wow. And all we were told is, you're doing this, you're doing that. We're not thinking about how big the shows are. We're just being told. To, and we're like, okay, cool. And you got to play live. We had no problem. <laughs> we do that all the time. Anyway, so Saturday Night Live, we're not realizing how big it is, but the host of the Saturday Night Live at the time was John Rivers. Wow. Big time. So we do the practice and they're loving it. John comes along and talks to us. And we didn't know how big the show was, obviously. But anyway, at the set, and this is going to throw you as well now. So I'll, I'll throw it in after because it all ties in. Okay. Um, at the same time as doing Saturday Night Live, we did Saturday Night Live. We did two songs. We did obviously Dutchie and Never Gonna Give You Up. Yeah. When we get when we get backstage, we've got now. Can you imagine? We didn't have these things. Yeah. Okay. So you couldn't play no games. <laughs> all we could do, we had this this Atari, and it was a blip. You know, with the ball across the screen, like the tennis. And we were so interested in that. Gene Simmons comes in to see us, to say hello. Wow. Because we'd met, we'd met the original Kiss group in Germany, right? So Gene's come back and said, hi, guys, how you doing? We looked at him and went, Gene, how you doing? And just ignored him and carried on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, so we've done Saturday Night Live and Eddie Murphy was on there, uh, Joe Rivers, obviously. And then the next day, we went into the MTV studios. We didn't know none of this until after the event. 
Okay. But we were the first black artists to go into the MTV studios to do an interview. Wow. Because they were playing past the Dutchie without any anybody pushing it. Apparently, Pete, Peter Waterman told me Tom Petty was pushing it from yeah. MCA. Okay. But Michael Jackson hadn't done an interview there, <laughs> and he had to beg to pay his, they had to threaten to pull out all the rock artists if they didn't play Michael Jackson. But music wow. was played on, on MTV regularly. That's what helped the band. So when we did Saturday Night Live at the time, a lot of people don't realize there's three hours between New York and Los Angeles. Yeah. You could have a, you could be a big success on the East Coast, but not successful on the West Coast. But well, we were both because of wow. MTV. So that kind of helped us. So when we landed in LA for the first time, um, we went to do a film with um, Mr. T. <laughs> wait, wait, go back. <laughs> go, go, <laughs> go back a minute. <laughs> Just, Go on. just run that by me again. <laughs> we went, we went out to Los Angeles to do a film with Mr. T. Okay. <laughs> and, the, and the Barabbas twins. And if you watched the, um, the Dukes of Hazard, the Barabbas twins are on there. Yeah. But Mr. T had just done Rocky Three, obviously. Yeah. And uh, when we met him, man, guy's neck is gold and everything. <laughs> he was so cool. He was so cool. And uh, we actually said to him, we said, we saw him again and we said, can you beat up Rocky in real life? Because <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you're like 16. And, uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah, but who got an older? Can you beat up Rocky in real life? <laughs> yep. And he said, no, I'm not answering that. <laughs> but he was telling us that when they did the film, before they did the filming, him and Sylvester Stallone, eight months, for eight months, all they ate was chickens, chicken and protein. That's all they wow. ate, chicken, for eight months. Something else. Crazy. And man. then coming back from there, mm. we got the call from Donna Summers management to come and record Unconditional Love. Wow. And we thought it was a wind up, so the manager put the phone down. <laughs> <laughs> Donna Summer wants to record the music of you. Shut up. Put the phone down. <laughs> anyway, when they finally realized it was the truth, we had to fly from LA back to New York, stop off, record yeah. the vocals, and then fly back. To London to get to school. <laughs> wow! <laughs> so we used to fly out the Thursday and come back for the Sunday to get back to school. And it was the time when they used to we they used to hold the plane for us because <laughs> we were flying first class. They'd hold the plane for us. Wow! Delay trying to get through customs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There were the times. So, that's just mad. Crazy. I know, I know, it's crazy. It is crazy. I always, I always think now, as a, as a grown up now, and I look and I think, what must have been, what must the, the businessmen who were flying first class at the time, were in first class lounge, right? They're probably looking at us thinking, what the heck? What the heck are these boys doing in here? What, what are these kids doing in this bit part of the place? Yeah. Another orange juice, please, in your best promi accent. But you say that right. We used to take our own food on the first class, uh, curry patty and goats and dumpling, and make them warm it up because <laughs> we didn't like the caviar. <laughs> I don't want any of this posh stuff. <laughs> no, <laughs> I tried it, but it was rubbish. No good. No good at all. Oh man. Yeah. So, so that's. I mean, I see some of the stuff now that people do, and I think, wow. We we. We even did, we even did the Montreal Jazz Festival. Now, people, the Montreal Jazz Festival is the biggest jazz festival yeah. in Europe, in fact, in the world, because the likes of, you know, Dizzy and, yeah. and Miles, they all love the jazz festival. Yeah. Quincy Jones Jazz Festival. They all. But we did. If you were headlining the jazz festival, you headlined on the Saturday night. Well, we did the Saturday night. And they filmed. We got. I've got the full footage. Wow! We used to go on stage one at a time, and the crowd was just it was just rammed with people. Absolutely. It was July tenth. Yeah. Nineteen eighty-three. We did the Montreal Jazz Festival, and then we did the Red Reggae Sunsplash in Jamaica. Biggest reggae festival. That, that must have been a gig. That must oh, that have was, been a gig. Well, to start with. Um, the festival was gaining momentum. 
and yeah. Bob had passed away, obviously. Mm. And when we rehearsed, we rehearsed in a hotel room, and uh, Ziggy and Stephen Marley, they came. Ziggy and Stephen stayed with us most of the time. Wow. And just sat there watching us play, you know. And then we were, <laughs> we're supposed to be off stage by half past 10 because of our age. Yeah. Yeah. Think about it, Pete. We're in Jamaica. So we get backstage for about 10 o'clock, right? So they're pushing it now. <laughs> Soon come. You know what happened? Soon come. 11 o'clock come, gone. 12 o'clock come, gone. 1 o'clock come, gone. We're still ain't on stage, you know? No. <laughs> We're still backstage. Wow. We got on stage at, I think it was about half past 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. And that's why, if you go onto YouTube and you put your music for you, Sun Splash. Yes. You'll see when we sing past it. When he actually, the, the, the video for, the official video for Sun Splash that year, we got the longest section. Wow. And that was, when we got on stage, it was that late and we were that tired. Songs are kind of, <laughs> <laughs> they were slow, you know. Anyway, so when we get to Dutchy now, Calvin stops stops the song and said, oh, what go on? What are you doing? <laughs> I'm going to try, you know, move. And it can, it can be, go on, go on. <laughs> move, man, move, man. And then we start the song again. Oh, <laughs> man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, Calvin, give give, give the Jamaican audience uh, a bit of uh, cussing, so to speak. But it was, it was nearly three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Crazy. And, yeah, yeah. And I'm assuming that... Um, uh, did, did, am I right in thinking? Did I read this? Right? You left at one point. I did. did yeah, you in left. Fact, I was talking to Michael about it. <laughs> I, I, I left when I was eighteen because I wasn't happy. Yeah, I wasn't happy, and uh, for me, and it's more poignant now because we talk about mental health. It was about being happy in yes. myself rather mm. than you know needing the money or it was it was just that I did leave at one point, and. Uh, that's when I ended up in Los Angeles. In fact, before I got to Los Angeles, I did. Uh, the only time I've ever been out of the country for Christmas was in Ghana. Okay. We did a tour in Ghana. Me, me, Michael, no, me, Patrick and Junior, um, the band Amlak, some guys from Birmingham. Yeah. Jackie Mitu. Do you know Jackie Mitu? He was no. one of the original writers of Pastor Dutchy. Okay. Pastor, keyboard player. Yeah. yeah. He taught he taught uh, Mickey Virtue in UB40 out to, to bubble. Jackie Mitu, uh, he was in the Scatterlights. Okay. Jackie Mitu is a reggae legend. You wow. look him up, Jackie Mitu. We share the same birthday. Okay. Anyway, so we ended up in Ghana. And at the time, Christmas time, is when they expect the military coup. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> Timing. So the Ghanaian government, we they were throwing people off the airplane Christmas Eve to get us on the flight. <laughs> And we played in a place called Kamasi, which is in a shanty town. Yeah. The shanty, biggest tribe in Ghana. I didn't know this at the time. But when we sang 007, in there you got a shanty town. So they were absolutely nuts. There was a hundred thousand people in this in this in this stadium. Wow. Hundred thousand. There's thirty thousand people behind us. <laughs> they have two little speakers. Right? <laughs> yeah. That's mad. Man place they wouldn't let us out the building they wouldn't let us out we went on first we played with um also visa remember also visa yeah gotta be a sunshine day yeah so yeah we played with them and they put us on first we couldn't they wouldn't let us out they wow. just said no 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 let's block the gates we had to sing five we had to sing oh seven twice they said why they put you up? why they take you out you got to go on <laughs> Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so, and then it was 70,000, 70,000 in the National Stadium. Wow. 100, 100, it wasn't 100,000 in Kamasi, it was 110,000 people in Kamasi who played it on top. Wow, see, that's just crazy numbers, guys. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah Live aid man. numbers, man. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, I got a question from uh, a producer, Pete, who we were chatting with earlier. Yeah. He's, uh, he says, uh, do you remember, um, where, are you, where are we going? Does Dennis remember where the video to She's Trouble was shot? Yes. Go on. Milton Keynes. Milton Keynes. 
Milton, Milton Keynes Shopping Centre, because he's a at Milton time, Keynes boy. He is. Yeah, it, it was Milton Keynes Shopping Centre, and at the time, Milton Keynes Shopping Centre was the biggest indoor shopping centre in Europe. Wow. And it's where they filmed Superman 4. Really? Yes, <laughs> trivia 4, yeah. <laughs> With Christopher Reeve. <laughs> okay. Here's some trivia 4, yeah. And do you, it's another question here, do you remember appearing on Blue Peter and having to explain Dutchie? <laughs> <laughs> yes, because we took a Dutch pot in. Did you? <laughs> yeah. Well, bro, what, to, to be fair, I don't know if we we, we did a um, cover mill at one. Yes. And which was a big daytime show at the time. Is like you think of the morning the shows now on you know on ITV and BBC. We did cover mill at one, and from that, the single just took off again. Wow. And. When the single went in at number 26, the record company didn't even expect it to get to number 50. Really? From, yeah, yeah, yeah. They didn't expect it to do what it did. So it went from 50, it went from 55 to 26. Then it went from 26 to number one, which was unprecedented. Yeah. They never expected that. I mean, now people go straight into number one. That's because of the pre-sales. Yeah. This was actual sales. This was people going into the shop, buy the record, take it home. Yeah, God bless one, Woolworths, man. Yeah, one day, <laughs> They shifted 116,000 singles. Wow. How many day. How many singles do you reckon you've sold in total then? Singles? Or, or, uh, altogether. Uh, altogether. Oh, I couldn't tell you, Pete. Uh, well, Dutchy did 5 million. Yeah. So let's just go 5 million plus. Wow. Let's go with that. And then uh, uh, my discs aren't here. My discs are inside up there on the wall. But um, double platinum, easy. And... He had a, we, we had an Ampex Gold reel as well. An Ampex Gold reel you can only get if you sell a million records. Wow. And, then, and to top that, we then got nominated for a Grammy Award yeah, for reggae course. music in America. Yeah. I mean, Lost Pub, but they don't really understand reggae now. But there was no section in the Grammy Awards for reggae. Mm -hmm. And uh, so... We went to the Grammy Awards. <laughs> that was a game. That was a game <laughs> because the Grammy Awards we were at. Yep. First and foremost, we were up in Redondo Beach. Mm -hmm. That's a way out in Redondo Beach. And then we took the limo. And we'd already we'd already met Michael at the time and been to his house in Encino, Janet, Jackie, Jackie, Marlon, Tito, Randy, Jermaine, uh, and Latoya. And we'd done a song, we'd recorded a song with Latoya, but the record company wouldn't let it release it with us. So wow. we went on our album, but they didn't push it. Anyway, in the back of the limo, we're watching a video. Now, having spent some time with Michael, and Michael showed, it was me and Michael Jackson, Michael from Musical Youth and me, his two neighbors. He said, look, I've just done this for Motown. I'm gonna show you this video. It was Motown 25. And he put it on, and it's when he did the moonwalk. Wow. And we were like that. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't believe it. Anyway, so <laughs> his snake was there, muscles and the, that, the monkey, um, it was bubbles at the time. And uh, <laughs> muscles is the snake that Diana Ross sings about. I want muscles. <laughs> and that boa constrictor. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, his room was just a mess, <laughs> just one big mess. Anyway, so I said to him, what are you going to do next then? He said, well, I'm going to do one more video for the album. Yeah. I like I like horror movies. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to do a video for Thriller. Didn't say anything more, that's all. Anyway, when we go to the Grammys now, they've launched Thriller. And we're in the back of the limo watching Michael Jackson's The Making of Thriller. Now, to some people now, you think, well, that ain't nothing. But to us, we're watching a video in the back of a limo. <laughs> this was a big thing. Wow. And we, we get to we get to the the venue, the Shrine Auditorium in Los Angeles. And all you can see when you look out the window is limos. So you look to your right, there's a limo. Look to your left. Look to your left, there's a limo. And we're thinking, <laughs> Nobody ain't going to know us. Who's going to know us here? Nobody's going to know us. Anyway, we've got our talks on. They open the door. The wall of noise. 
was so loud. All you could hear is, it's my, it's my, no, no, it's my girl. Ah! We were so, we, it frightened us so much. We ran into the, we ran into the auditorium. And we had three security guards that had to run with us. And people were like, what the heck? <laughs> we were like, okay, <laughs> calm down. Wow. And um, that night, sat by us, was a guy named Irving Azoff. Now, Irving Azoff, do you know Irving Azoff? Right. He was the manager of the Eagles. Okay. But he was now, he's now got, he's now got the biggest management company in the world. Wow. Yeah. Clear, right? Anyway, I'm going to go any further. Irving was head of MCA. And he was rolling with Don King. Okay. <laughs> Irving Azoff's like five foot one. Don King is six foot four with his big hair, <laughs> right? <laughs> Don King has just signed the Jacksons to the Victory Tour. The whole of the music industry and music promoters are up in arms because this boxing promoter has got the Jacksons on tour. <laughs> and just... all, they're see- all they're seeing is we've lost all that money. And yeah, Don's yeah, just yeah. Like, Yes. Yeah, because it, it, it was one of the biggest grossing tours ever because he got Pepsi to pay out 25 million before they'd even left the house. Wow. And had to, had to buy an aeroplane and everything for them. What? Just when Michael, remember when Michael got his hair burned? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's... Cool. <laughs> that Grammy Award ceremony, James Brown, Quincy oh. Jones, Michael Jackson, or you, you named them, they were all there. Michael picked up the eight Grammys that day. Yeah. That was, record-breaking eight Grammys. And uh, we had a whale of the time we went to the party because he was just walking around meeting all these superstars. Like, yo, look who that is. Yo, look who that is. Yo, and they want to talk to us. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, we we were awarded a, an award from the, some, some guys, some governors or senators in... Los Angeles. Yeah. Which is like the second key to the city kind of thing. But yeah, um, yeah, I mean, the Grammy Awards is something else. Just totally, it's just something else. And they can't even fit everything. I mean, people see it now and they think, wow, but to be nominated as a reggae band in the Grammy Awards and there's no reggae section, I don't think even the band knew how big it was. Yeah. That's like the, the, the big thing. Yeah. It's just it, it, you, you, you're I, so we were talking to Pat last week, Pat Sharp, yeah. and um, he obviously he's wrote this book that's um, that's right, I saw that. Yeah, it's 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 like a it's about him, but it's kind of an overblown Mickey take out of himself, really. Yeah, but uh, take out the Mickey. You should write a book, man. You no, should. That's, that's, that's Pete. I'm actually. I'm actually doing research now and I'm trying to work out how I'm going to put it together. Do you understand? Okay. I'm going to sit there and type it all out or do I talk it out? Well, yeah, yeah. Do I talk to Pat? Talk, talk to Pat because he, he, talk he did that. Dictaphone. Talking to a dictaphone. Yeah. It's only sometimes when I start talking to people about certain situations that yeah. I remember things, it triggers. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've got stuff upstairs. I've got all the memorabilia, all the photos. And I mean, because at then... You know, holding on to the camera. We all got given um, this camera. Do you remember the this camera? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I got, I got a picture here. Look, I, I on. Where is it? Uh, it's not happening. Oh, what was it? Nothing's working tonight. Nothing's <laughs> to working. I got, a, I got a picture of uh, of you guys, but it's holding not holding the camera. Uh, yeah, it's not working. Oh, anyway, go on. <laughs> We're holding the this camera at me. <laughs> a lot of people don't realise also that we were we were, we were sponsored by Nike. Were you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so check this out. We go to record the I'll give this story. We 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 went out in, in the summer of eighty three, we go out to record the second album. Yes. Yeah. Different style. But on the way there, we had to fly to Thailand, Japan, then Los Angeles. So we did a show in Thailand sold out with all the soldiers and the people can stand up going mad to crazy. Then we fly to Japan and do some shows, live shows. We was there in Japan for 10 days. We went to Disneyland in Japan and uh, went on the, the bullet train. Oh, what was that like? What, what? The, bullet the bullet train was an experience and you go past Mount Fuji. But my experience was 
the guys in the band upset me, so I was just sleeping. So, <laughs> they just vexed me. So, 300 miles an hour, the bullet train goes, and it's wicked. Wicked. You see Mount Fuji, and you go, wow. You know. Anyway, um, we, we, we fly from Japan to Los Angeles, and you go back across the date line. So, if it's four o'clock in the afternoon in Japan, it's nine o'clock in the same day in the morning in Los Angeles. Yeah. So we get to Los Angeles, tour manager, manager. We're staying in Beverly Hills in a house. The second designer to Yves Saint Laurent was staying in his house. Wow. Up in Beverly Hills. We're there. So the tour manager goes off. So there's the manager and us five there. And they've triggered the alarm. But they haven't told us the password. So the police turn up, ready. Security turn, police turn up. So it was me and Patrick and Calvin outside playing football. Junior was inside practicing his drums with his headphones on. Mike was in his room and the manager was in his room. So the man, the, the security guard said, get the guns. Over there, over there. They got the guns out, you know. We're like, what? <laughs> what, what, what? What's the password? What's the password? I'm going, I don't know what the password is. What password? And then I heard him go in his radio go, I got three possible juvenile delinquents here. And I thought, juvenile delinquents? <laughs> I haven't watched um, my favorite, one of my favorite musicals is West Side Story, Officer Crookie and all that. Yeah. Anyway, I, I got to understand delinquents. I know delinquent. I said, listen, he said, get by the wall, get by the wall. So the three of us are sitting there and I'm laughing. And he's going, what are you laughing for? I said, well, I know this is a big mistake, officer. So <laughs> that's why I'm laughing. In the meantime, unbeknownst to me, his, co- his colleague has gone in the house with his gun. <laughs> And he's seen Junior sitting there practicing his drums midair with his sticks and his headphones on. And he's practicing his drums like air drums. And then the manager walks out of his room and he's like nearly six foot big Jamaican with a big beard. And the, the officer sees him, get over there, over there with his gun. Over there, where? So they get us all in the room now. They're going, they're going what's the password? What's the password? I'm like, what are you on about? What's the password? We don't know no password. We're here, we rented the house. No, we want another password. What are you doing here? Whoa, whoa, whoa. We're here because we're a group, blah, blah, blah. We don't believe you. And then all of a sudden, the tour manager turns up with the food because he's gone out shopping. Password is in Istanbul. <laughs> <laughs> By the time they realize now, they, they come back and went, uh, Can we get your autograph? <laughs> wow. Yeah. Just, just, just unbelievable. Just something else. It's just like when I look at it, you'll never see the like of it again. Music of youth. No, no. It was too organic. I mean, we, That's why I mean. we haven't even touched the surface here of 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 the band and, and about the book. And, and, well, yeah, uh, about the band and about after those um, the days of. Uh, of doing all that flying around and all that and then it, things go quiet a little bit and and yeah. then what 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 happens then what do, what do you guys do then right so this is three years of whirlwind because yeah. at that time bands were expected to do an album every year mm. your first album and this is just experience your first album is a lifetime so whatever you hear it's a lifetime's work after that it's one year one year but now guys are leaving it longer now yeah um, we couldn't tour solidly because Calvin and Michael and Patrick were under 16. So we could only work 42 days a year. Right. Complete recording albums, doing videos, live shows, TV shows. Mm-hmm. And that gets frustrating because we had to apply three weeks in advance of any live show, of any TV show, of anything. We had to apply three weeks in advance. In the meantime, other artists were able to get carry on, like be on tour, come in, did a TV show, and off back on tour. We weren't allowed to do that. Um, so, although we were rehearsing, rehearsing, writing, rehearsing, and recording, it just became a bit much. Yeah. Instead of somebody saying, in hindsight, if somebody would have said, "Look, take six months out and just chill for a bit." Yeah. We'll see what we can do about the education. In fact. We even muted moving to America because in America, as a young artist, what they would have done was sent you with a tutor and all you had to do was be school for three hours a day. 
Right. Which is what the Jacksons did. And you hear a lot of the artists, the young artists, that's what they did. If you go to Disney's factory, whatever, of artists, they would have been doing the same. They would have been schooled. Yes. And performing, schooled, and recording their TV shows. Anyway. So, got to a point where I just wasn't happy. I'd become a Christian, and I said, this isn't the be-all and end-all for me. I was only 18, I didn't know nothing, I thought I knew it all. You know, I got money in the bank, <laughs> what the heck. I was having this discussion with Michael today. I said, to be fair, it wasn't about the money, it was about my happiness and my well-being. Yeah. I had good support from my family, and I just retreated back into the church for a good while and actually ended up in Ireland for what was supposed to be a three-week tour. I ended up staying there for six months. <laughs> <laughs> Touring uh, Southern Ireland mainly. I yep. mean, I went to parts of Southern Ireland in 1986 where black people never ventured. <laughs> and I met so many guys that used to drive the 55 bus and the number 11 <laughs> bus and the number 8 bus. <laughs> And you know, the Irish call themselves the blacks of Europe, don't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah they do indeed. And I always used to say, if you go into Birmingham and you see a black man and a white guy sitting at a bar, the white guy's usually Irish. Irish, yeah. <laughs> well, I learned to my Guinness. So, well, I mean, look, we, I, uh, producer Pete just sent me another message saying, w would you come on again when we when we yeah, got, got you know, things... Listen. It is me and you, man. Yeah, man. <laughs> <Anything>. <laughs> <laughs> um, next, when we, when, we, when we get on, we're structured. You get your question and go, there, we, there. I, I, don't tell me no more stories until you tell me this. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to, I, I just, I, I was, well, I, I was desperate to, to get the, well, uh, to get the, the, the Los Angeles story out of you and, and that, <laughs> and the SNL thing out. That's and that. Listen, I haven't even given you the, the, the story when, we was in, we was in, the, <laughs> <laughs> we was in the, yeah. you got to imagine this, right? Okay. There's no games, there's no PlayStation, no nothing, right? We've got to get up to all kinds. But anyway, we'd met some girls on the phone. Uh-oh. And decided to meet them up, meet up with them. But we're up in Beverly Hills, right? <laughs> there's no email, there's no internet, there's no texting, right? You can only phone from a phone box. <laughs> <laughs> So we decided to meet him down on Beverly Hills Boulevard, right? So we hatched this like, plan. Like you do. <laughs> yeah. We hatched this plan. Me, Calvin, Patrick and Gina was going to go and meet the girls. Michael, because our tour manager, was a guy named Tops Henderson, Scouser. And he's come from looking after rock bands. When I say rock bands, I'm talking about Black Sabbath. Um, Ian Gillen, never kind of, you understand? He's not used to these little kids <laughs> that have to be in bed by 10 o'clock. <laughs> anyway, so we did a recording of us all talking in a room, tape recording, right? This is the ingenious part. So we put Michael in the room, lock him in the room, he locks the door, plays the tape like we're in the room. Oh, man. In the meantime, we've sneaked out to go down to, Be down to Beverly Hills Boulevard to meet the girls, <laughs> right? Little did we know, there is no pavement in Beverly Hills. You understand? <laughs> when you're walking, you're walking on the road. I was like, this is Beverly Hills, there's no pavement to walk on. <laughs> so we're running down this hill, <laughs> right? All these dogs coming out, barking at us, we're running down the hill. We get down the hill there, we're walking along, we're, we're walking along Beverly Hills Boulevard, the four of us now walking, yeah? Bops in a dog. Hmm? All of a sudden, this minibus, this minibus pulls up. <laughs> it stops. You bunch of idiots! Get in here! Because <laughs> we duped him and we that Michael was in the room on his own. <laughs> so, we're, we're, how how long? Yeah. Do you we? As, as you know, I listen, I love these stories, man, and we'll yeah. definitely get you back on again to talk. But before we wrap things up, right, I want to know, when did it all start to wind down? When when was when did it it start to because you you really in the business you 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 know as well as I do that that you can be up there one minute and then you're down yeah. there the next and you kind of 
you, you don't know what's going to what's around the corner. You got an idea, but if you like you said about the albums, you got to do one a year and that kind of thing. Yeah. When did it get I mean, to the point for you guys when you went and looked behind you and went, okay, back to Sheldon then? Oh no, no. It, to be fair, it was mismanagement because if you think about it, mm. we broke in America. Yeah. A lot of artists hadn't. I mean, I don't even. I could name some of the artists that are massive here. Nobody knows them there. Yeah. In America. Do you see where I'm coming from? Mm. So for us, it was more mismanagement and not understanding yeah. how successful the band was really. I was talking to Michael today when I said, look, when we were released from MCA, he just threw every A's off because they'd signed, they'd signed a, a Candy Girl. Oh, uh, New Edition. They signed New Edition, mm -hmm. right? Different, totally different, right? And they let us release this from our, our contract, but they paid us. Wow. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. They paid us money. So little did we know that a lot of artists, when they leave a label, they actually owe the label money. Yeah. They paid us. Wow. So I was, we were like, what? Anyway. We did a tour of the Caribbean, and that's for me when we started unraveling. But that wasn't because of the band. That was because of management not understanding how to move the band forward. Yeah. You know what I'm they got rid of people who could have helped push it forward and tried to do ghetto style, where really you've now got an international selling artist. Yeah. Do you understand what I'm saying? So you've got an international selling artist, and you haven't even done. Australia, where you have a success. You haven't done the whole of Europe. I mean, Holland went absolutely nuts for the band. Yeah. You know, the guy who looks after our, 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 our social media, he lives in Holland because he, he grew up with the band and he loves it. And it's, it's, it was, how can I say, it ended not horribly because we never got like the press giving us a hassle only because we never did the London thing. Yeah. We stayed in Birmingham. You know, we'd go to London to do what we needed to do, but we stayed in Birmingham. UB40, if you think about the split with UB40, the, the family split and the, the band split, it's not as big because, I don't, I don't mean to disrespect it, but it wasn't in the press as much because it's not in London. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's true. That's it's, true. In Birmingham? Yeah. So it's not, if you think, you know, we know that if we're going to have any success in this country, you don't have to do it now. But back then, it had to all come out to London. Yeah. You know, it's like in America now. You remember, it was either New York or Los Angeles. But now you got Atlanta. Yeah, true. That that becomes a hub for the industry. Do you see where I'm coming from? So yeah, yeah. It all kind of centralised it. But it was a case of I left and then the band kind of, petered out not knowing I mean I'm 18 Michael's 16 Calvin's 14 yeah 14 Patrick's 15 no when I left Patrick was 17 so we hadn't even started yeah we hadn't even started you know and it's only as I look at it I go wow and when I went to do the show with Snoop and the amount of respect from all the artists, man, we grew up listening to you guys, blah, blah, blah. And as as, as Dutchy comes up, this, they're like, yeah. <laughs> they just go, absolutely nuts. And I ended up last year doing um, some 80s shows. You saw me at um, my head, man. What was it with Pat? Oh, the, um, the thing in Shrewsbury. Let's Let's the, fuck. Yeah, Let's yeah, rock. yeah. Let's right. Rock so Festival, yeah. I went out, I went out to America and did a, a an American version. And I'm telling you now, it was Flock of Seagulls. Uh, Bow Wow Wow. Wow. Who else was on there? There's, there's, a, there's a, quite a few. And I had a, I had a moth flying to my ear the night before I flew out and a moth flew into my ear and a moth got stuck in my ear and I flew to Los Angeles with the moth in my ear. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I could hear my ears bouncing around my house. We had to throw olive oil to drown it. <laughs> it oil. Cooking oil down my ear to drown it to stop it from moving. Wow. 
and I did my show, my first show in San Diego, and this moth was still in my head. And I came on stage and they were all clapping. It's like, what the hell? That show was rubbish. It was rubbish. And then I saw it. I was like, okay, it was not that bad. <laughs> but uh, yeah, even you know, it's, I, 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 I sometimes I look, I sit there and I go, wow. I'm just from I'm just, I'm just, I'm just from Birmingham. <laughs> yeah, but mate, you've had an amazing career, and the well, thing. Well, it ain't finished yet. <laughs> <laughs> I just had a hiatus for a bit. Yeah, you know what? I and and sometimes you got to do that, ain't you? You got it. You've got to t- take a little break. I mean, I, I took well, a break from DJing for six years, and um, and God knows when things will start happening again. But you know, I'm quite enjoying doing this little show and. And yeah, that, well, you've just, you've just moved it on a bit. Yeah. Because you've made it more interesting for you. I mean, for me, um, you, you know, people talk about this lockdown. Mm. We, I told you, look, when we were stuck in, in them rooms for hours on end, we never had this. Yeah. We never, we never had a PlayStation. We had to just make do. We yeah. had a pool table. <laughs> had videos. That was it. Yeah. And bloop, bloop, <laughs> Nothing so fancy as you know, Formula One sport or whatever. <laughs> so between working between two rooms and I love my house. So when I come home, there's a part of my house, I can just go back and just chill. If I need yeah. a quiet room, I've got a quiet room. If I need to just be in my bed, I can go in my bed. I want to sit in here watching TV and there's not Netflix and whatever, but we used to spend hours between two rooms yeah. the recording studio and the, the uh, control room. That was it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the first time I went into the studio, the man to meet me was Sugar Minot. Wow. And he ended up digging under the piano <laughs> at Easy Street Studios. So, you know, it's like, wow. It, it, that was, and it's, the band kind of, as I said, just petered out. And if you think about it, Pete, when you're in school and you've got your school friends, you think mm. about how many school friends you still got from secondary school. Oh, wow. Now. Yeah. Close relationship. <clears throat> I'm, lo- I'm lucky. Yeah. Because I've still got, you know, I've got friends that I went to junior school with that I still know. Mm. But there's only a few people, Calvin and Michael and Gina would know what we went through. Yeah. Me and Michael are tight, but we did fall out and we didn't talk for a good while. Really? We didn't know why. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what do you know at 18? Yeah. You don't know nothing. You know nothing. You think you know things. Yeah. But obviously my experience at 18 is different to a lot of people's and I have to tell people, look, you know, I have been left on a flight, on an airplane where it's first class. Not that it bothered me, but I have. So I can actually fly, I've flown around the world first class. Like I said, we were sponsored by Nike. And I remember going into Orange County and they opened up a store for us one Saturday morning and said, right, come. What do you want? So we got all these trainers. <laughs> and the woman says to me, oh, because I, I went in and I didn't have any socks on and I had these old rusty trainers. And she looked at me and went, you can have the socks. I'm like, okay. She said, but you can wear, you can wear the new ones, the new trainers at the short store. I looked and I went, I can't wear new trainers at the store. <laughs> Mum would kill me. <laughs> you don't think you don't worry about it now. You'd put them on now and walk out the store with you. No chance. And I remember when we, we when we flew out to Los Angeles, when we flew Thailand, Japan, Los Angeles, we went, we flew out with five of us, six bags between the five of us, right? When we arrived back in Los Angeles, from Los Angeles here to go to school in the September, we had 35 bags. Wow. Between the five of us. And you know what we did? Nothing to declare. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to declare. <laughs> and the, the customs guys used to see us and go, all right, boys, and off we go. They never stopped us at all. <laughs> never stopped us. Never stopped us. Seriously. Crazy. Oh, yeah. It's just, just, you know, uh, it's, it's a world away um, from being in Birmingham and people used to say well, when you go to school do you have a security what I walk to school <laughs> what no security you walk to school yeah I walk to school 
Calvin and Mike used to come in the minibus because they lived further away. Yeah. But I used to walk to school. And then, you know, at lunchtime, the girls used to come in from other schools to come and look for us. Oh, uh, Just, but yeah, the school grounded us. We, we, we kind of kept us on our feet. And we decided as a band that, every, you know, we were flying out to Los Angeles for the weekend. It's nothing now. People don't think of it as anything now. But back then, to fly, we weren't even asked because anybody scared of flying. We just put on a plane <laughs> and we flew from London to Newcastle to do Rasmataz with Alice Perry and uh, Rasmataz. <laughs> Rasmataz. And you know, was presenting Rasmataz at the time as well. There was she's Suzanne Dando. Yeah. And Suzanne Dando is a girl called Being Around the World. Uh, uh, Lisa Stansfield. Lisa Stansfield. Yeah. And I'll never forget, Lisa used to stand there and just watch us. She just watch. <laughs> yeah, we, we, I don't know why. She just watch. But I remember last time I saw Lisa to talk to her, I was coming up out of Houston Station and she was in the queue going back to, I think it's Bolton she's from, isn't she? Uh, she yeah, Bolton. yeah, yeah. And yeah, that's it. She was going back to Bolton. And I've never seen her since, but obviously her uh, career's gone on. You know, and that's why sometimes when I was doing Let's Rock, and all the artists were coming up and, you know, they'd say, oh, yes, blah, blah, blah. And they'd start talking about when they go to the clubs and whatever. And I'd look at them and go, clubs? We couldn't go to clubs. Are we going to get in the club? <laughs> <laughs> what the heck are you talking about? But the, 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 the beauty for me is when I did them 80 shows, as old as I am, they're all older than me. <laughs> it, it is a bit, because I, how old are you now? I'm 53. Oh, ah, yeah. Because I, I, well, I'm, I'm 49 now. You're so, a baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> How old's Michael? Michael's 51. Right, okay. Calvin's the youngest because he'd be 50. 50. He'd be your age. Now. Yeah. He'd yeah. be 50. Yeah. Yeah, because Calvin's three. No, Calvin's 49. He's 50 next year. He's your age. Yeah. So you could have been 11. That's right, yeah. Number one. Man. That's 38 years ago, you know. Thanks for that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to look at me. <laughs> I look at it and go, "Wow." Yeah, but you don't look. No, you don't. You, apart from a little less hair, you don't look any that's different. Cut, that's as I cut it all off, <laughs> shave it off. Because <laughs> I get sometimes I can see skin coloured, fle flesh coloured hair. I call it. Yeah, that's not good, man. That's not and good. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I was gonna say, I, I'm, I'm into my. Do I keep it? Do I dye it? Do I trim it? What do I? I, I, we, yeah, yeah, I like. But you know what? When you, you give it a di give it a diet a bit, and it just it likes stick on. It's it's not it's not Velcro. It's not good. The hair on my head was never this brittle. No, it's, it's not no. good. I had lockdown. I get my daughter to cut my hair now because I won't go to the barbers for now. But it's I just shave it all off and just keep it low, and I, I keep my. Just to show my age, so I don't look like a monkey, but <laughs> get more grey on the machine. But um, it's a case of we, we we mature and you understand more about life. But to be fair, once my kids came about, I, I needed to see them grow up. Yeah. You know, I'd read, i talked, spoken to so many people, like a successful businessmen who said, look, I was so concentrating on that career. I miss my kids growing up. I yeah, can't yeah. Buy it back. yeah. Can't buy it back. You know, walking my kids to school, making sure I was there, making sure we go on holiday together. Yeah. And this year, I mean, my daughter's 18 now, but this year was the first time I'd spent August in this country for a long, long time. So it was kind of strange, obviously, because of the lockdown, but it was strange. I still ended up in Somerset. And it's that kind of thing that I know that I'm happy. Yeah. I'm, I'm not content because I always want to be doing something else. I always want to be doing something. I'll always be recording. I'll always be, you know, I had a manager who tried to say, well, you want, I said, look, you can't stop me from performing. So if you want, you know, and me and him still talk now because he had a heart attack when he was right. in Los Angeles. Okay. 30s. Wow. And I drove him to the hospital, see the Sinai hospital. And he ended up, the bed next to him was Goldie Horn's mother. Wow. And Goldie Horn, he doesn't, he still to this day doesn't remember Goldie Horn holding his hand whilst he was on his hospital bed. Spark out. <laughs> I walked in the room, I went, oh! <laughs> <laughs> Took a double take. 
because it was like I'd seen her the day before, but I didn't realize who she was. Yeah, I just saw this blonde and she was stunning. And then next day, I'm looking at this blonde. Yeah, it's got a horn, <laughs> you know. And when I was in Los Angeles, I ended up playing football with Rod Stewart, Andrew Ridgely, and Justin Fashioning. Like, yeah, like, exactly. like you do. <laughs> and actually, I went out. I spent a day with Justin. And it was fantastic. It was, it was me, Justin, and two of his colleagues, college students that he coached football. And I was telling them about his goal. They won goal of the year, goal of the year with goal of the season. Yeah. And he flicked it on Norwich and volleyed it against Liverpool. And he said, I'm so glad you told him that story. <laughs> <laughs> and Rod, Rod was cool, man. We used to go to an English pub called the uh, Cat and Fiddle. And uh, after the game, and drink beer. And Rod never put his hand in his pocket. And there was a Portuguese guy that used to cost him. I used to be at one end of the table, like, like I am here now. And he'd bet the other end. And we'd all put $5 in for the beer. And Rod wouldn't put no money in. And he would cost him. He said, that Rod Stewart, man, he don't put his hand in. He drinks all the beer, but he don't put his hand in. <laughs> so, yeah, so. Oh, that, dear. Well, this, listen. This is the end. This is the end, Peter. This is the end. <laughs> There's going to be a part two. <laughs> that we got to do a part two. We're not even halfway through. Yeah, uh, quick so, um, thank you. Thank You're you, welcome. thank you. I appreciate you coming on. Um, we, we, we will do it again. Um, we've got uh, we've got DJ on next week. And we've got uh, another couple. Uh, Gavin James, his name is. You know Gav, don't you? You know Gav. He's a Butlins DJ. I do know Gavin. Yeah, you know Gav. This year. Say again. Was it his birthday this year? Oh no, he has a birthday every year. What was his birthday? It was the fiftieth this year, wasn't it? That we were gonna, yeah, we were gonna have a party. He was gonna have a party, and we were all gonna do a bit. Party. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was supposed to be playing at that party. Yes, that is correct. <laughs> well, that, because you were gonna be, you were gonna be on, and all the Butlins DJs were gonna do an hour reach. Okay. Which, which, which that was the that was the plan, but obviously. DJ Jules as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jules, Jules, um, all, all the all the Butlins guys. We're all going to be doing a bit, but the, obviously um, we're going to have to wait until he's a hundred. <laughs> well, if he's a hundred, that was a, what's that going to make me? Yeah. <laughs> so thank you me very much. Down by mine in today, in Bridgewater. Oh really? I was yeah. Oh man, that's <laughs> that's a that's a town with a brilliant thing going through it, like the road. Goes all the way through <laughs> that town. <laughs> Coming out. <laughs> Coming out. <laughs> we'll do it yeah. again sometime. Yeah. Um, you, you thought it out. I will. You know where I am. Yeah, man. I'll call you. I want to say, best thing to come off the. I'll do it. I'll do it. Hey? That's going on the next album, and I've got to get it for the for the live gigs. Yeah. When you're not here. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> Did you put it? Do you, have you got a recording of that on there already? I've got a live recording of it. Wow. I'm get it to do, yeah. I'll, I'll do a fresh I, one. I might, I might, because because of, of the essence and the people in the background. Yeah. I might just sample that part. Yeah. And put it in in the next album. It will definitely be on the next album. <laughs> That'll be my claim to fame. <laughs> yeah, well, when you heard it from the horse's mouth, yeah. <laughs> huh? Dennis so Seaton. You have been a brilliant guest. Thank you so much. Uh, we've enjoyed it, and uh, we'll hope we get you back on soon. Um, well, uh, uh, for those people who are watching, don't drop. <laughs> for those people who are watching everywhere, there's Periscope, there's YouTube, there's all sorts of different things going on. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed the show. Thank you to Dennis. We're gonna say goodbye now. Cheers, mate, and we'll see you soon. I'm I'm not gonna cut you off. I'm just gonna stop this thing. I'm not quite sure how to do it, but uh, thank you, Dennis. <laughs> You guys are sharing the screen. Oh, I don't know. Time, get all your, get all your, get all the buttons in order. Yeah, get them in order. All right, man. Thank you, Dennis. We'll see you soon. Yeah, bye, bye, mate. Day he's gone. He's gone. He's gone. He's gone. He's gone. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for watching. Uh, I got so much stuff. I, I my mono, my cameras disappeared. And oh, there I am. There you are. So um, we will we'll be back again next Wednesday with more nonsense. I don't know what's happened. Loads of... There it is. Look, see. Uh, somehow I managed to um, fiddle around with the screen before we started in a panic. 
trying to get the show sorted uh, and I ended up pressing all sorts of buttons. I've got lots of videos I was going to play. Um, I've got lots of clips I was going to do, but we had such a great interview with Dennis. I can save all them for next week when Gav's here. So that's it from me, Pete Sheriff, from Dennis Seaton for Musical Youth, from producer Pete, who's down there. Thank you, Pete. He's not under the desk, you understand. He's, he's, he's just, never mind. Uh, we'll be back again next Wednesday night at 8 o'clock. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you.